uh, we're just expecting few attendees to come and join because it just opened up and uh, uh, we are uh, live streaming also on, on the on the YouTube basically. Uh, I guess we have about 22 participants who have joined currently. I mean, we're expecting a few more participants to come and join. So in the meanwhile, uh, we'll also try to share our uh, good evening participants. I guess we are uh, uh, we are live on Facebook and as well as YouTube. Uh, uh, you can actually subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel and as well as uh, Facebook. Uh, to see this uh, webinar live. So can, uh, can we start the session? Yeah. Uh, can we go about it? Sir? Yeah, uh, so. we'll start yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is about uh, uh, one past four. Uh, good evening, uh, participants. Uh, this is IA uh, Tamil Nadu chapter uh, coming up with uh, one more webinar. We have a very interesting architect, uh, architect uh, Dean D. Cruz with us. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, I request uh, architect Loganathan, our joint secretary of IA Tamil Nadu chapter, uh, to welcome the gathering. Vanakkam. IA Tamil Nadu chapter has been coming up with a series of webinars uh, for the past uh, few weeks. We had a webinar, we are first uh, we started with the construction, that is on the structural uh, planning aspects of uh, buildings, and, the, and then we moved on to, to practice. Then we had another webinar uh, on uh, human and uh, human and all that. Uh, we, then we thought of uh, something on the community and sustainability and so on. When, uh, when we are looking at the names, we could uh, 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 find uh, none other than uh, our uh, architect, Dean De Cruz, uh, who's a very familiar name, very popular name of uh, Pan India. So we have our architect, uh, Dean De Cruz, uh, here for our uh, uh, program here. And uh, this uh, uh, program uh, uh, is uh, it's a, one of the series, and we are going to continue also further. At this point of time, I want I require I request our uh, architect K. Sindhir Kumar, Chairman IEA Tamil Nadu Chapter, to come over and give the welcome speech. Over to architect Sindhir Kumar. Good evening uh, to all. Uh, I welcome again all the participants, the panel members, and our keynote speaker, Mr. Dean D. Cruz, for this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I have been going through Mr. Dean's uh, website in the morning when uh, like you know like i should say only one thing the thing is normally we say that god lives in detailing but in many architects works i see the same god living in the same detailing uh, in most of the works <laughs> but uh <laughs> seem to have got a lot of gods so a lot of gods seem to be living in a lot of different different details i think i should really uh, appreciate you for the fact and generally in cooking you see um, Michael. Generally, in, in cooking, uh, when all the ingredients are same, the final dish also will be the same only. In Goa, uh, you know, like uh, the climate is the same, the local available materials are the same, the, the labors are the same. But in spite of using the same ingredients, so Dean is able to come out with a lot of different different dishes. I think that is one of the biggest uh, um, uh, <coughs> which I like to appreciate uh, here. Using the same technology, when you're using the same available materials, but none of his two products are same. When you see his website, you can just understand that uh, he never repeats the same thing, even though the basic available inputs are same. That is his speciality. And <clears throat> normally, by seeing his works, I don't know how he is he's able to make working drawings or uh, get the drawings approved. They are so uh, you know, organic in shapes and so, and, and you know, like uh, free flowing in forms. 
and uh, his designs are like a poem and music which i'm sure we cannot make a working drawing for that unless i uh, i i think he will take the pad to the notepad to the site make the sketch there and build it there and come uh, only then it's possible if you sit in the computer and try to make working drawings i think we have to spend our time endlessly such uh, our designs are so flexible and uh, i th i think uh, mr dean should touch upon this point during his speech like like that is how uh, how the sketching and how the uh, the thought process uh, allows you to come up with lot of organic designs which i feel if you give it if you, if only we submit it to the, our approval agency they will get totally confused they will, they will, they will reject the drawings because they cannot understand so this is one of the you know like the his the, his designs are so flexible and you have to uh, listen from him only and and it's it's very difficult to learn this cannot be taught in colleges mr dean worked with uh, gerard the kunwa i think i'm his boss and then he learned all the techniques he also experienced and now uh, he is uh, he is able to adopt all those techniques we welcome you sir um, and uh, we are eagerly listening uh, waiting to you or to listen to your presentation thanks again sir thanks a lot thank you architect chandel kumar uh, chairman uh, ia tamil nadu chapter for uh, giving that welcome speech uh, to strike the note on the right side and uh, actually uh, uh, i've been given the honor of also introducing uh, architect dean de cruz actually he doesn't need a, a formal introduction he is a very popular over but still no i just make a small formal uh, for formal dissect we'll do that uh, in fact uh, Uh, every time no we will say no we are pleased to welcome you we are pleased to bring you have you here and all that but uh, for a change we want to say sir uh, uh, thank you for taking us to goa so that's what we have to say so uh, architect dean de cruz uh, a gra graduate from sir jj school of architecture is actively involved in professional practice as well as in academics for more than 3 decades he has uh, conducted numerous workshops and seminars on architecture planning and environment across india as well as abroad his works are articles have been published in leading magazines of the globe he has supported the royal art and architecture academy stockholm oxford brooks university uk and pratt university uh, new york for their uh, architectural and planning programs in goa he also has been part of a state level committee for making of the regional plan 2021 for goa he is a partner and principal architect in uh, mosaic design combine a leading design firm based in goa involved in urban intervention architecture conservation product and graphic design at mosaic they explore prospects of symbiotic growth of their clients with the nature and sustainable practices in design to provide holistic solutions so very heartfully we welcome you sir uh, this is over to you kindly carry on Yeah, hello everyone, and uh, so I'll share with you uh, a slides of through my journey, you know, from starting out and what I uh, before the word sustainability actually became a, a word that was used. Uh, we started off as low cost architects, and uh, uh, though my education as an architect uh, in college was very technology oriented, uh, moving to Goa changed that a lot, and and the influence of people like Laurie Baker uh, were a great influence in my. the life in the early years yeah. so i'll share with you a slide now I'll, i'll end with where we are at the present moment right from the start to where we are at the present moment looking at sustainability as a guideline yeah so so that's mosaic where where a planning and product design firm which also gets involved in uh architect i mean architect and product design firm also get involved in planning issues uh our early work uh, when we partnered with gerard we called ourselves natural architecture we have influenced a great deal by lorry baker gerard actually worked with lorry baker and uh, he was influenced by him and i in turn got influenced by baker and the great thing about baker was his tremendous simplicity and directness of work and if you talk about sustainability i think we were one of the first proponents of sustainability and sustainability from the point of view of just being completely low cost and i mean people ask what's a sustainable building and i keep on saying 
the moment you bring down the cost, you're going to use less material, less energy, and it's automatically going to be low cost. You don't have to apply these fancy you know, lead and all these other rating systems to it. It's all about being sensible and being smart about the use of materials and technology. So early buildings actually recycled a lot of stuff. We recycled the uh, you know, old building materials, stones, columns. And over the years, we actually trained about 200, 300 masons in construction. So really we taught them to make arches, vaults, domes. You know, these, are, these are things that we learned, uh, which people used to actually do very naturally in uh, urban and rural areas but we seem to have lost it over the last uh, 15 years or so. So this was a great opportunity to actually share this uh, uh, knowledge with people who wanted to be, you know, revive this building techniques. And we're happy to say that we actually built in the first 10 years of our practice, we actually built all the buildings we designed very much like a Baker style or a Baker approach. And uh, all those masons have now become contractors on their own and they actually take it forward with working with other architects. So we feel very happy that this has become a movement more than just you know a single practice cell. But architecture isn't just about building buildings, it's all about creating urban space as well. So this is a project which is we call country courts, which is actually a series of houses, and we created village streets. So it's all about creating the outside space. I mean, you have the building, no doubt, but you also have the village space that you actually work with, and you shape those spaces through the architecture. So these in this project, we actually created various courtyards you know, of different shapes, and every unit is completely unique and completely different from the other. Uh, in this project, which actually uh, brought us a lot of uh, accolades, and uh, it's called Nelai, which is on top of a hill, uh, we, it was very difficult getting the building material up to the hill. So we actually dug out the pool, used the rock from the pool, and built the structure. So it's, it's completely local in a way. I mean, from just, you know, maximum about 50 meters away from the building, all the, most of the building materials came from there. And of course, we, we imbibed the style, which is a bit east meets west, where we actually looked at the architecture of India, the architecture of abroad. And since it was a, a foreign lady married an Indian man, it also worked in that way. And we minimized the amount of usage of materials. So we, all the doors and windows, like instead of using wooden frames, we would just rebate the stone and uh, uh, put in these very light steel windows you know, and doors into the structure itself. Uh, the living room, for example, is, is a giant dome, which is about 11 meters in diameter. Uh, it's made completely out of bricks and mud mortar, just with a cement coat on top. And it was built in four days. And you realize that, you know, why do we have to use concrete when there's so many earthy materials that we can use? Here? And it just needs training of people to, to do this. And then a lot of architects, young architects, especially not we see today who are actually now slowly taking this up on their own because there's sudden frustration with the modernity of architecture that we see today, which in which we're using you know, concrete or steel in a certain way. And it's become extremely industrialized. We've, we've lost, lost the ability to craft our buildings. The wood that we do use in, in our buildings is really a very local wood and a wood which doesn't cause damage to the environment. So most of it is coconut wood actually, which grows very fast, in which you don't feel bad cutting the tree. It's it, because of it, the growth rates are much faster. They don't Im impose on forest areas and go like you know, Kerala and a lot of parts of South India actually have a lot of coconut wood to spare. So it's a very good material. The coconut wood if treated well can last a hundred years without a problem. In this building, of course, there's only one concrete column in the whole, in the whole house, it's, it's a house come hotel. And so that's the only thing that uh, supports the central uh, pinnacle of that building. And a number of the rooms, of course, are built with uh, brick domes uh, over it. Again, recalling the traditional method of construction. Uh, <clears throat> and that was built, of course, close to 20 years ago. But uh, even recently, we challenge ourselves. So this is a house that we built just a few years ago, which was built for about 11 lakhs. Uh, uh, it's still expensive by Baker standard, but but it's it's where we actually got the people of the house involved in the construction of the house. So the man of the house actually bought the materials. The lady of the house did all the detailing of it, uh, you know, all the painting work that is there. And uh, so it's almost like a single space house. We use actually levels to divide it. 
and the boys of the house, the two sons actually got together and started actually making all the things that they needed. So the doors, the windows, you see the basin there, it's got this little scooter tap that you turn the handle and you know, the water comes out from it. So the old skateboard become the shelf. So there's a great amount of participation, you know, by the client in the actual construction of the house, which is really important. As architects today, we tend to sort of completely disconnect from our drawing boards and what is done on site. And the, and the client doesn't, doesn't feel part of the whole building process. So it's important to actually engage with them and, and get them on board to build it. Uh, we were approached to do a monastery some years ago, and uh, it was for a group of Spanish nuns, and they wanted a building that would last uh, you know, 300 years without any, it's a cloistered monastery, so men are not allowed into the building. So how do you man, create a building in which there's no maintenance? Sir? We said the only material which will last for 300 years without any maintenance, concrete will last maybe 80 years, steel also has a similar age, but stone masonry can last hundreds of years. We've seen in historic buildings. So, we decided we'd, we'll build it completely in masonry. And uh, so this is even the roofing system. Of course, when you finally built the building, we, we compromised on the roofing system because it's Goa, it had to have some anchorage, but that's the final building of the monastery that uh, we designed it. And so we work actually with history a lot. So it's important to actually understand that when we look at even sustainability, it's all about continuity as well. It's all about how do we take the past and take it into the future as well. So this was the library building uh, for the university in, uh, it's the Kanna University based in Hampi. Uh, and we said that, you know, it's historically Vijayanagar has used stone. So let's continue to use stone in this building. So even the columns that you see there are all stone columns. That's the plan of the building where it's about 50,000 square feet. It's got a giant courtyard in the center and it has the gopurams on the edges. So the gopurams are actually wind towers. So you let in air, hot air from the high level, you take it into the building, you cool it, you hydrate it, and it takes the temperature down. And that's the final building you see. The columns are six meter high, 50 by 50 centimeter granite columns. When we asked the, the contractor to do it, he said, I can't do it, you know? And we said, they've done it 300 years ago. You, you know, why can't you do it now? And so quickly he got his act together and put up the columns. So we tried to, recall again building systems of the past and it's so simple there's no shuttering nothing where the, the columns are perfectly strong and perfectly straight to allow to hold up a building so again looking at how do we and how do we look at the past it's important to understand how do we what do we draw from the past uh, when we're talking about continuity so this is the spa we did for the Taj uh, there was an existing structure there but we completed completely gutted it and it's, it's an Ayurvedic spa. So for an Ayurvedic spa, the history is really about, uh, it comes actually from the temples of Kerala. So we, we went down to Kerala and started looking at what, does, what is the spirit of a Kerala temple? And uh, the spirit was, of course, uh, a, the gradation of space at the entry, right from the deep stem to the, the Otlas where you sit in. And as you move in, the space becomes more compressed, darker. And so we created this sequence of spaces that we move through and eventually you enter the hall of contemplation where one side is lit with diyas, with just oil lamps and the other side has natural light moving through the space. So you have, that's where the main light comes over the water and the inner wall is lit just with diyas and all the rooms are done thematically like earth, air, fire, water. So again, we're drawing from the past, but we're doing modern contexts in, in the design of the building. Uh, so another building in, uh, Karnataka, it's actually in, in um, just south of Goa in Karwar. It's a cathedral. It's, it's, and the cathedral is the mother church. So it's a very large church. And we, again, the tradition there is, is building in granite stone and, and of course, uh, the Mangalore tile roofs uh, of the area. But we created a giant pavilion of a building, a building where the roof actually floats completely above uh, the building. So it's, we use the granite stone in the walling system. And the inside of the building is like trees. So it's a series of trees that actually support a roofing system and the roof floats completely above the wall. So the walls are non-structural. The walls just are completely separated from the structural system. And, uh, and it's a tiered building. So it's unlike a normal gathering space where everything is on one level. Here, the sight and the view and the sound, everything being tiered, uh, people can have a proper view of uh, the building and what's going on at Master. That's the basic structure that we use. Uh, so as you see, a lot of our influence actually comes from outside Goa. So even though a lot of our work is in, um, 
in uh, <clears throat> Goa, we we have Kerala as a great inspiration for us. Sir. So we we've. Uh, <clears throat> this my phone. Uh, <clears throat> and the Kerala architecture is really responsive to the climate. Yeah. So the Kerala architecture, for example, has these doma-like roofs that uh, uh, really extend. And Kerala has a climate similar to Goa. It's, it's raining outside at the moment. It's really heavy. And so we need deep roofs. We need deep overhangs. Uh, so we create a building where the roof is like an umbrella. It just spans over thing. And it's also, when it's non-monsoon time, it's very hot and humid. And therefore, you need great ventilation. And these domas act as these great ventilators, allowing air to actually flow through. So our houses are more pavilions. They're buildings that actually the air moves freely through them. And so we've designed now a lot of our work. We've over the years we've designed close to 350 houses, and most of them are these pavilions. They're these very transparent buildings where the air just moves completely through them. Where you can shut them off when you want to, and when you want to open them up in fair weather they just open out to the landscape. So it doesn't matter about the size of your house. So long as it opens out to the outside, you can make it as small as possible. This, of course, is a very large, fairly large house. So all these houses respond directly to the outside. They, they use a very pavilion-like approach to the architecture. And yet they try and route them to the locality in terms of you know, what the materials we use and the style we use. In. Uh, in the last 10 years or so, we, we were approached by different hoteliers to actually work in the jungle. And it's, it's extremely exciting for an architect to actually work in these jungle areas. And most of the areas we work are actually tiger sanctuaries. So this is for the Taj group of hotels. It's, it's a lodge in a place called Bandhavgarh. Uh, Bandhavgarh is a hot and dry climate, and therefore we need very good insulation. And uh, so we said, you know, if we're doing a lodge, it shouldn't stand out. It should look like part of the jungle. It should look like part of the architecture of the area. And therefore, we decided to do a mud building. But it's not a typical mud building. It's actually a smart mud building. It's actually a two walls. Most mud houses in the village, be just one thick wall. But we needed even greater insulation since we had to air condition the space. So we did a double wall and put insulation in between it. But you can't make out because it's, it's hidden completely in the mud in between. And we used in the building, of course, in the courtyard, we used all the local materials, whatever you could do in terms of the, the artifacts that, that were available locally. And the inside looks very simple and like a village house. It's got simple bali roof. Uh, you know, we built up the furniture, used again the artifacts from the village itself. And we actually got the men of the village to build the houses and the women to decorate the houses. So if you looked outside, you'd see the mud work on the, plus, on the wall outside. So, it was a participative process. So sustainability is all about actually taking people on board. It's, it's not about disconnecting people and creating these fancy technologies. We have to take the community on board to build the structures we design if we talk about sustainability. So these are lodges in different places across. This one is in, in the Satpura range where we're different in different areas, there are hilltops, there are riverfront, and each, each is a very different configuration based on the view available or on the location it's sitting in. But all using natural materials. So for us, it's a great experience because you're using a new material, you're working in a new climatic region. And it's important that we challenge ourselves with this thing because if we stop learning, <clears throat> we start in, stop inventing as well, and we start degenerating. So we need to actually keep ourselves on our toes in terms of how we actually deal with architecture and keep on learning about architecture. This is a one of the central pavilions, the dining hall in one of the lodges. Uh, this is for the coffee day group uh, in uh, Bandipur. Again, here we got the men of the village to actually do all the stonework, the patchwork, and the women to do the decoration uh, off, the, off the hotel. That's the reception area and building. And all the units are, again, done with very simple plaster. In fact, just handmade plaster. There's no trowels used. They just did it with their own hands. That's the restaurant uh, area of it. <clears throat> the more recent lodge will be finished in Pench, a tree lodge. Again, it's all trees taken from the local forest where we, they cut down the logs. Whatever trees are died, they cut down the, lo the logs, and we can use it actually for building it. Uh, this for the Taj, again, we're using all the fallen trees. Uh, again, pavilions which are open. So while certain places may be air-conditioned, certain places are open pavilions. They just connect to the outside completely. 
and you can uh, you know be in part of the jungle uh, and feel part of it and, and very low cost and effective sort of spaces just mosquito nets will close yeah there is an air conditioned room also but most people prefer to sleep in this particular space yeah. this is a large close to bhopal where we decided to do it like a village so it's it's a cluster of you know three or five little rooms around the around the courtyard and they all is there many of them totally about 35 rooms uh, in the hotel and that's the card the corridor just came stone slabs stuck in the ground bamboo and and reed as roofing systems that's the courtyard that leads to the, the village rooms that's the reception area where you come in it's again very simple straightforward minimum amount of materials that we put into the design there it's a large of it recently completed in kana where we elevated it because when you elevate a lodge it's your treetop level and the whole views are extremely different there that's the public area of the lodge you can see by the pool and we actually created an ecological system in this so when we when we did this lodge we actually created new lakes and harvesting though the pool of course is filtered water we had we need to bring water in to the site not take it from any other village area so we actually asked to harvest the water first to be able to even use it for our pool so we didn't take our footprint beyond the lodge uh, so we work a lot in not only in jungle areas but also in in crz areas coastal areas which go as part of and where you're not allowed to build permanent structures so for this particular project there was an existing building we wanted to add more rooms so we added these wooden cabins which can be completely dismantled and for this we looked at the japanese and the japanese are really inventive when they look at uh, the architecture because the architecture is is lightweight it's temporary in fact the japanese uh, the shinto temples are rebuilt every 20 years and so they they want their civilization or their generations each generation to know how to build a temple so rather than build something that lasts forever every generation gets a chance to rebuild the temple so it's an architecture which is constantly evolving and changing and refining and therefore it's so uh, it's so tactile and so detailed in its thing so here we so we decided to take a japanese theme so the four rooms that we put we show the japanese respect to the place in a very jap style so even the the poem on the wall is a japanese haiku the beds and everything and sitting areas are elevated so you can see that it's actually off the ground it, it completely elevates off the ground so it, there's no plint at all to the building uh so as we work in these areas like the coastal areas like this is for the taj in uh, sri lanka it's in ventota a little restaurant uh, that we did on the beach over there again a pavilion in a way since we are a product design office we were able to actually even prototype all the so we actually designed all the furniture here and go prototyped it and then sent the finished products to uh, sri lanka uh, so it's very like pavilion very low cost again this is another pavilion done for the taj in goa uh, the total cost of this pavilion is uh, this was 9 lakhs and they earn about 50000 rupees a night uh, profit because it's a 40 cover uh, restaurant uh, so we realized that in a couple of weeks you can actually cost cover the cost of the whole building and it's very difficult to do in a permanent building in a temporary building it costs so little that you can actually do something like this where it's it just covers the whole you know capital cost of your structure um again very simple methods using all natural materials in the construction <clears throat> uh so we work in different parts different climates this is for a project that we're working on in in uh, outside bijapur it's a school uh where it's a, bijapur is a hot and dry climate and we needed to capture and uh, cool the air into the building so they have these brick towers bijapur has a lot of bricks uh, so it's a, it's a very standard grid that we used in the thing which is also a structural grid and a ventilation grid so it takes in hot air at the upper level cools the air brings it into the building uh, and cools all the classroom and uh, play areas below that and the walls are just partitioning some two partitioning systems uh, between the classrooms yeah. uh, for the same group uh, this is their main library building again where all the classrooms are elevated so the section through it is where it's a tiered classroom thing so it's cool from underfloor so the auditorium also has an underfloor air conditioning system uh, the classrooms which are naturally ventilated have an underfloor ventilation so the cool air comes from below off the green lawns and then escapes through the roofing system and the roofing system can open out so you, you can get natural light 
also from that. So when you're looking at you know, sustainability and energy systems, there are a lot of things we can do on our buildings. We tend to box our buildings in and we tend to sort of, and then we try and put in forced ventilation and you know, forced lighting systems into you know, unnatural lighting systems. And especially in this pandemic, we realize that you know, buildings need to ventilate. I mean, air conditioning buildings are a complete disaster when it comes to health. So we need natural ventilation systems in our buildings to actually make it perform better. This is a project that was stalled, which is a, it's a, it's an office building in Noida, where we uh, wanted to do a completely dismantable building, where which was uh, so it's a fully prefab building, which has got hollow columns, hollow beams, where all the services actually run through the structure. Most often we do a structure, and then we slap on the services into it. But here's a building which actually integrates the structure and services together into one element. There. That's cross section through the building. And these are the various green systems of how we're you know, passively cooling this, the building and, and all the other things, like solar pergolas on top to get energy. Um, this, was one, this project was one turning point in, in actually working consciously in sustainability. It's, it's actually for the uh, it's a sustainability demonstration center for the Pune municipality. Uh, unfortunately, it never got built, but we are shortlisted for this uh, project. Uh, it's just the side of a railway line, and it gave us a chance to actually research sustainability and what are the aspects of sustainability, whether it's materials, uh, it's the way you design your space, it's the technologies you plug into it, and it's being an exhibition center, it had a lot of holes in it, and we looked at how, how we could actually, you know, create things that are multi-purpose, how could we cool the building, how could we, uh, we light the building, how could we grow food in it, how could we harvest water in it. And all these ideas you know, came together and coalesced. So all these ideas also started coming up in the buildings that we do. So these are a few projects, again, which are on the anvil. Some are stalled also. And so that's for lodges. So as you know, in a lot of jungle areas, you have it's sometimes some part of the earth is very hot, some part of the earth it's very cold. Uh, so we designed for both. We designed for winter section, where basically we looked at how do we actually keep the building in winter, with capturing heat and light, and how do we cool the building in summer using the same building, but you know, creating thermal blankets, new ventilation systems and into the building and responding to it in a certain way. This one is in Buj. Again, incorporating technology in what would you see as an otherwise very normal, ordinary looking building and how do we actually plug in that technology to make it work a lot better. That's another building in the section. Uh, <clears throat> This is for a project on a small island off Goa, where we're allowed to keep the buildings only six months of the year. So we have to take it off every six months, and then we can build up. So it had to be very lightweight because only a small boat could get there. So it was just made of two foot, eight foot panels, which you put together, and you every year you can keep on changing the configuration. And the panels even have furniture built into it. The flooring is just you dig in into the sand and you uh, put some stones on the edge, and you. Put the panels in so you don't even need a pucker flooring the flooring it just sits the, the floor tiles sit on sand itself and you can keep on changing the configuration every year and create a modular system and, you, and if you want something larger you just expand the thing so that's the finished uh, product of the restaurant area um, of that lodge and it's important to actually go back to our roots so very recently we were just asked to do this very uh, simple bamboo pavilion so we said uh, for the Seven Deputy Festival that's held in Goa. So we got the whole office together and said, let's make it ourselves. So we got together and we actually started making the pavilion out of bamboo, re reinventing the, you know, the structural system of, you know, how we're using steel cables in it and, and putting it together. So you have to get your hands actually dirty. We, as architects, we tend to disconnect and slowly we go, I mean, we go to the drawing board. And as uh, I think Manwar mentioned earlier, I mean, a lot of our work, our early work actually, uh, was with very little drawings. We'd make all our decisions on, on site. We'd just uh, make a little sketch, go to site, and say, okay, fine, put the wall up this length and turn this wall this way. And it's extremely intuitive. So you have an idea in your mind what the building is going to look like, but you take those decisions on site. So you're able to respond to the site, the trees, the wind direction, the, the views, much better in a way. So that's, that you can see is the, the finished uh, pavilion that we built for them. Uh, so we work a lot in the social space. So this is done by my partner, who is a product designer. So we were asked by the Danish aid agency to do a school where 
for the children of uh, construction workers, those construction site workers actually move uh, very often. They move from site to site. The children don't get a proper education. Uh, so we felt that they need a school that moves with them. So we managed to get, uh, at least the agency got the teacher that could actually move with the school. And <clears throat> so the school is just a fold up school. It's on a tractor trailer bed. So as they move from site to site, they fold it up, they tow it to some new destination and the school reopens again in half a day. Uh, <clears throat> this is a tourism project. We work for the Maharashtra Tourism, tourism Development Corporation. They asked us to do a 40 room hotel and uh, it was bang you know, on the beach area before the CRZ regulations. They bought this land before the CRZ regulations came into it. And eventually when the CRZ regulations came in, they couldn't build on it. But we said, don't write, but you know, why do you need a hotel? Because what you need is tourism. So why don't you let the people of the village actually have their own hotel? So everybody's got a one or two room hotel and you coordinate all those rooms. So we got the, all the uh, fisher folk of the, of the village. We said, you know, they, they so use the water. We can design boats for them. So they can actually have these floating platforms that you could rent out as rooms to stay on. And the rooms would come together at nighttime and daytime separate out. And the farmers, the village, we could we measured all their houses in the village itself. We proposed changes to the houses or extending pavilions on the outside. And we said all the extra money that you have, which you'd otherwise built a hotel, drew up the facilities of the village. You know, so put in uh, uh, their jetties, put in their uh, beach facilities, put in their uh, you know, for their places of marketplaces, their place of worship, do it up. So it improves the village because tourism is meant to primarily improve the livelihoods in the village itself. Tourism, most often, like we see in Goa nowadays, is actually is detrimental to the thing. The moment it goes beyond a certain capacity, the local population gets affected. So it's important that the local population benefits first. And that's, that's also about sustainability, where it's all about how do you take everybody else that's involved in it on board then. So for me, an inspiration in, in architecture has been this architect called Christopher Day. Christopher Day refuses to design a single building. He designs buildings together. He creates communities. So he gets people together, so 10, 12 families, say, you want to do 10, 12 houses. And <clears throat> so he'll design houses for them. He gets them, what do you want? What, each one having a separate, different use. But they're common facilities. So there's a common kitchen, a common dining area. And they start sharing their resource. They grow their own food in the area. They cook together, or there's a collective, you know, sort of kitchen that is there. So they're not, you know, 10 families cooking 10 separate meals. There's one family that's cooking for 10 families. And it's, it's a great system of uh, creating something that's ecologically sound, that's economical, and also creating great community spirit. So his work has been an inspiration in trying to get communities together, get people together. And we can see examples of this all over, if you look at say the Aga Khan Awards or the Curry Stone Awards, it celebrates the whole idea of how do you get communities together, whether it's building, you know, public buildings like the school where people, every the whole village is involved in the whole construction process, creating community buildings like you see in Southeast Asia, or even here in, in Honashala in, in uh, the Buj area, you can see if they've involved the, after the earthquake, Honashala has actually got the people to recall their building systems and do some of the most wonderful uh, you know, building designs, just using the local materials and empowering people and you know, building in mud, building in, in patch, and recalling all these systems that we've lost. Uh, we see fantastic experimentation, of course, in, in Orville, which are very close to, of people trying to push the agenda on what is green and experimenting with the place like, like Satrain's work over here. And young architects, you know, like the ones who designed this also are really getting excited and taking this thing. So it's really, for us who are on the point of almost retiring, it's, it's really inspiring to see young architects you know, taking this on forward, being influenced by well, it. And it's, you can see our past history has such wonderful examples of, of buildings made by communities. So whether it's in these hot dry areas in places like Morocco, uh, where you know, even mud buildings go up to like eight floors high, our mud buildings have different shapes. If you look in Bhutan and as some of the other areas in these cold desert climates, so Earth has a tremendous potential to actually be used again, and in a lot of cases, and, and stop using the industrial materials that we've had. People like Hassan Fati have demonstrated it in some really prime examples of you know, great architecture. And Ladakh, we have people who have actually 
done it like people like Sonam Wanchuk who, who actually explored like how do you heat a building in a cold climate. So the, the people are actually showing the way. And, and at times there's not even architects. We look at Didi Contractor who actually looked at the traditional architecture and and found a way in which you can be, create some wonderful pieces. So it's, architecture is really about empowering people. It's really about giving back. As architects, I think we cater to only 1% of the population. So we need to empower the people to build themselves. We can't let it go to a normal contractor or engineer to actually design the buildings. We can see the disasters that are happening in our cities and our rural areas. But people have the skill to actually design with great amount of passion in it, great amount of aesthetic in it, but we need to re-empower it. We have the technology. We've, we've been trained in a certain way to do that. And our job is not to design individual buildings anymore, I feel. I feel our job is to re-empower the communities again in the building process. You look at people like Revati Kamat also, some wonderful work that's been doing. If you look at Neela Manjunath, so brilliant work that's, that's going on across the country. So we need to, to learn from these as architects. And can we now actually work with communities and get them to actually recall their traditional building systems. Yes, do impose new materials if you have to, and do, do bring in new technologies that are appropriate to the, to the region or to the, the locality that you're building in or to the building type that you're building in. But we have to get more people to understand the building process and get them you know, trained in the way that how do you actually look at structure, how do you look at aesthetics, and you'll find this, that there'll be a tremendous movement and improvement in architecture all over. I'm shifting now to Goa, um, to the planning side of me. And Goa, I've been, part of, I've been an activist for a number of years and very concerned about uh, uh, the development of Goa. And because I objected to the previous regional plan as punishment, they put me to prepare the new regional plan of Goa. And I realized it's far more difficult to make a new regional plan than to stop an old regional plan. So. It's, so even though I'm not a trained planner, it was a great learning experience for me. So if you look at Goa, it's, <clears throat> I mean, like some parts of um, coastal areas of Tamil Nadu, we've got you know, wonderful beaches, forest areas, uh, fields, orchard areas. So we said we have to preserve all that. We have to keep that intact. So we allow development only in very restricted areas. We started mapping all the ecological zones of Goa and mapping also the settlement areas of Goa. And we graded them into different uh, densities, you know, where you could have greater densities in, in, a, in an urban area, less densities in village areas. So we contain development in a certain way. We used Google and we, we said it's a participative process. We, we need to get everybody on board. We need to get all the villagers to come there and decide what they want for their village. So we, the first thing to, un, for, to get the villagers to understand, because a normal village say, okay, let's, we can build anywhere. And, uh, but we decided that we need to show them that when you talk about development, we talk about infrastructure, there's there are two types of infrastructure. One is the infrastructure that we see, which is really the buildings, the roads, the factories, uh, all the public areas that we have over there. And there's where people normally live. And there's the green infrastructure where you got, you get your food from, you get your water from, you get your, it sequesters your carbon dioxide, your waste material is processed over there. I mean, and that's green infrastructure. And, and green infrastructure is probably, you need about five or six times more area to support in terms of food, water, energy, to support the gray infrastructure. Therefore, it's important when we do planning, we have to ensure that there is enough green infrastructure to support the gray infrastructure. And so we decided that when you do a village plan, you have to ensure that there is a good amount of green and you respect the slope in the land, so you harvest your water that's coming off the hill, we respect the fields, so can you double or triple crop your fields so by creating water systems? So all these are the things that you're putting to it because the village is after all uh, a complete unique. This is from a book called 20, Goa 2020, which Raul Mahotra worked on, uh, where he talked about the village as a unit of development where everything is there, your fields, your water bodies, your orchard areas, your harvesting areas, your settlement areas. So it's a cell of development and Goa's actually consists of some 300 odd villages. So it's like an organism, so it has 300 different cells in it. And afterwards, after we explained to the people, the people came back to their own plan. They said, okay, this is where we want our settlement areas. We want to preserve these fields. We want to harvest our water here. Uh, in this particular village, they mapped all the banyan trees in the village. So they said, we, have, we cannot al allow these banyan trees. They, they uh, marked all the bird nesting sites, the animal parts. So people connected. You'd, 
Yes, professional planners are needed to prepare a plan, but the people know the ground reality. So it's important that the people are involved in the planning process and they can actually make a plan far richer than what any planner could do. Uh, when working with the Stockholm things, we, we realized that the watershed where, where water is collected is an important aspect. Where water gives life, where water gives our food, it gives us all the things that we need to do with water. So therefore, water is a controlling factor and, and the watershed is basically an area where all the water comes and collected. And India, for example, is one giant watershed and you keep on subdividing into various areas and every river has watershed and all the tributaries of the river are different watersheds. So we looked at different watersheds in the areas and, and a perfect watershed is, is a village actually. So if you can actually see a village which has one collection source of water which moves eventually into a river or the sea. But each village needs to network with another village. Each village needs to have some sort of cooperation. So one village may be producing rice, another village may be producing bananas. So there's trade that happens. So you need to network villages for a proper ecological and economic things. So this is a village that we worked on which is a perfect watershed. So on the green sides you see on top and bottom are the tops of the hill. And the red dots you see are springs. So by restoring the ecosystems, we were able to regenerate the springs. And right in the center is the green space where all they grow all their, uh, their paddy and their other cereal crops. And on top, on the hills are their orchard areas where they grow all their fruits and vegetables. So it's one water source that comes from uh, the right-hand side of the slide and leads to the left-hand side, which eventually leads onto the sea. So it's the perfect watershed. And along the way, as we, we created these, what the, you see the blue little dots that you see there are the uh, check dam areas, which actually hold the water back and harvest the water you know, for the village. So, so watershed is actually a perfect governance model. So we need to change our governance model so that we design it around watersheds. Most people have governance model where the river is in the center, one side is one uh, village and the other side is another village or road is in the center, and you know, it's divided by the, but a watershed where the actual collection source in the center where all the water is from one particular area is a great model for governance because you're controlling so many things of food, water, energy in one sort of uh, geographical area. So working with, uh, with the college, these are the various ideas they have, on, you know, how do you create and get people to participate. So agro tripping was one idea where we said, you know, it's like Southeast Asia where uh, people live in these farmhouses, they learn how to farm, they learn about growing. So it's not about just having fun on the beach. It's all about also learning about the ecological systems or living in the forest areas and learning about all the biodiversity systems that were there. We're, we was part of the Western Ghat, which is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. It's, it's, on, it's nine on 10, which is only second to the Amazon forest. So we, we're extremely lucky to be in this area and therefore we need to uh, preserve it and also you know, showcase it to the world such that people respect it and Right now we're facing, we're having a great difficulty. We see a lot of development taking place. There's, there's big hue and cry about new railway lines and new roads and new power stations coming up in the Western Ghats. And all, a lot of the environmental laws are being compromised. But it's important that we, we fight to preserve these things. Sir. And because it's, it's something once we lose, we're impossible to get back again in any short time. Aquaponics is another area which, which shows tremendous potential for you know, civilization to go with where it's your basic, it's, it's uh, where you're actually looking at uh, agriculture through water and how it's a symbiotic system. So the waste is actually going to also produce food and both. So you get both, you know, fish and you get uh, plants also in the system, which is a symbiotic system um, <clears throat> of nature itself. And I've been to this very interesting city in uh, close to Stockholm. It's a new city, which is based in an old industrial area. And in this particular city, it's based in the old factory buildings. They've, they've uh, so rather than build on a new empty piece of land, all this land was, most of it was paved over. So they decided that they'll build this new township in this uh, degraded area and if, around the central water body and create closed loop system. So um, Arby's uh, is really a place where they're just four or five story buildings. Uh, everything is a closed loop where you know, water, energy, food, everything is together. So everybody's got a little piece of land where they can grow their own vegetables and, and food over there. And, and it's all about also ecological and economic systems. So people are able to sell the stuff which is you know, actually made locally in those little streets. It's most of it is pedestrianized areas. And it's, 
it's all low rise buildings so no lifts even are needed in these in these areas and it's all about small communities that integrate with each other so that's an example of what a closed loop system looks like where again you're looking at water you're looking at energy you're looking at waste and how do you actually integrate it so nothing goes out and everything is used efficiently uh, this is a um, <clears throat> a place in uh, is, is an architect planner called uh, soon in uh, i met him in uh, in actually kerala uh, fairly recently he made a presentation and he proposed for singapore uh, a new city where uh, the city singapore is fairly large spread out urban thing but he said suppose singapore had to be uh, a smaller more walkable city where we just had a 1 km by 1 km city where in the center you had factories and that seemed like a disaster because why will would you want something polluting or energy intensive in the center but he said the moment you put the most polluting part in the center of a city you will make sure that it works well you'll make sure that it's efficient that it will not pollute and because this, that is where actually everything is produced that's where you actually get all your goods from and everything is processed and your distribution is actually much less so the energy taken and the materials taken and actually providing materials for the people is reduced so you essentially becomes economical and also your transport systems go from one center of the city to another center of another 1 km by 1 km city so it's so this is where i propose these 1 km sort of patches with green land all around so everybody in the city doesn't have to walk more than 500 meters to get from you know the center of the city to the edge of the farmland so in the center you have the factory around that you have the commercial areas market areas your institutional buildings then you have your uh, your housing and your recreational areas and eventually you have your food producing areas which are your fields so even though it's very utopian in its idea it's actually uh, you know very smart because and if you look back in time this is exactly what our villages had though it may not have had manufacturing in the center but our villages were these little small patches among a far green and and you just had a road connecting one village to another so we need to look at how do we look at a new village model where you have dense pockets of you know communities that are able to sustain themselves but it doesn't become a large town or a large city so our rural areas can be these areas with with very small sort of community centers and townships and they're separated by farmland so you have a lot of breathing space from one area to another so around the world we've seen i mean besides housing it's tremendous uh, experimentation this is the eden project in cornwall where again they're trying to create different climatic regions in the world and showcase new technologies and materials for the world to see to adopt in different parts of the world so it's a great learning center uh, for people in sustainability and how do you actually this was an old coal mine and rather than you know fill this coal mine up they said let's use this old coal mine and create something new and uh, inspiration and education for the general public that's a detail of uh, the eden project yeah. so the world is moving towards a cities especially now in this pandemic situation like in goa for example most of our food and vegetables come from outside goa come from karnataka from hubli darwad and uh, even though we have some of the most fertile land people have gone lazy or they've changed their jobs and gotten to tourism so they've stopped growing food but the world over is now realizing especially in europe that they need to grow food in the cities because they're getting it much quicker they been sure that the food is organic the food is is safe to eat it doesn't have fertilizers and pesticides in it even new york city has there's a movement called gotham greens where they taken taken over the top of uh, the multi story buildings and they're actually growing their vegetables so for some of the high end restaurants actually are getting their vegetables they say we're growing it in the city itself you know so it becomes an even added value to the people eating that it's it's actually extremely local oroville as you know is a fantastic example again of a city which has a core so of course the spiritual core and it slowly moves out you know into the greens of it uh, though uh, sadly the, the sort of galaxy idea that is not is not there uh, as was thought of earlier but what's turned out in these little communities which are doing different things and and pushing sustainability is really interesting to see it happen and it's a great inspiration i think every young architect needs to visit places like oroville to get inspiration as to what it is about sustainability it's not just about energy and materials it's also about building communities and working with people uh this is an economic model that's now actually coming into the world uh 
quite uh, popularly. It's called uh, the donut economics uh, model, uh, where basically it's, it's controlled by, by two zones. One is, of course, the ecological zone, which is the outer thing of, of all, what are we facing today in terms of climate change and other uh, loss of fresh water, and the social zone in terms of what we're facing in terms of you know, health, the food, and all these things. And <clears throat> we can see that it tends to be pulled in different directions. Whether there's climate change, meaning there's a lot of heating taking place, or on the external face of it, and internally we have food shortages, we have serious health problems. So the whole idea in creating economic models is where do you spend money in the right place, such that you know you create an economy which is controlled, an economy which is really um, uh, it's circular. I mean, most economies are what they call linear, where there's a lot of wasted. You know, you, you make something, it goes to consumption and eventually ends up as landfill or just wasted. So there's a lot of energy wasted, material wasted. Whereas circular economy is one which everything is recycled. It's a closed loop economy, like I showed you in the Stockholm example. But there are various aspects to it. And this is becoming extremely popular because it takes the two main areas of sustainability, which is the ecological uh, parameter and the social parameter into account. And both these need to be taken and, and weighed in a way which makes it uh, possible for societies to, to use the sort of uh, resources that we have judiciously. So you can see the how do they, this is the a regenerative model where we actually create these systems and, and we have a distributed link that, that links all these uh, components together. Uh, so from ideas of that, there, there's the idea of slow cities that came up in Europe. Now, a slow city is something where it started actually from the slow food movement where uh, slow food is all about you're not having fast food. It's, you know, so people sit down, relax, and have their meal. Uh, most restaurants, you know, fast food thing, you take a thing, you, you don't even sit in the restaurant, you pick up your burger or pizza and you walk out. But these cities decided that you must have a meal nicely. So you build, not only do you, have, you digest well, but you're able to actually interact with people, you create communities, you create friendships. And so it's all about, so the idea of slow city is about people slowing down, walking a lot, uh, using recycling energy. And as I said, it's really about creating human bonds. And that's extremely important, especially in the pandemic, we see that the only way we can actually tackle it is, is by creating, recognizing the humanity in us, um, having a sense of empathy. And it's only, we can do that only when we slow down because when we had our normal lives before the pandemic, we were every half hour, we had some appointment rushing up, we didn't care about what people said. But now when we slow down, we really care about what our neighbors happening, what's happening in, the, in our next city. Is everyone okay? We call up our friends. So we realize that the moment we slow down, that's possible. So we need to be able to slow down and slow cities are becoming, first people thought that they're gonna be economic disasters. When you slow down, you won't make enough money. But these are actually becoming one of the most popular places to live in because the quality of life has improved. And even economically, these people are doing much better than the fast cities. We see today how our cities and in Bombay, for example, all the migrants have moved out and the cities are collapsing because they don't have people to run it in. So in a slow city, if it's comfortable that to live in, you, distances that we have between, between houses are greater, the health systems are much better. So therefore we see, we need to actually have a far more humane city and, and the slow city methodology that we use is, is, one, is one way we can do it. In, <clears throat> And we need to exercise empathy. This is an example in a place called Curitiba, which is in uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil, as you know, is, uh, is a third world country like us. You may think it's in America, but it's as poor as we are. In fact, poorer maybe in some parts. Uh, so, but, so there's this architect called Jaime Lerner. Jaime Lerner became the mayor of Curitiba. And he decided to actually start a lot of these social experiments, environmental experiments. So he pedestrianized a lot of areas. Uh, he put in new rapid transit systems, which are unique, uh, which even Volvo and Mercedes actually bid for to run um, as systems. And but Kurichiba also has some of the biggest slums in the world, uh, and which had full of garbage and uh, very poor, poor nutrition. So he decided that you know, and, and their farmlands outside the city that produce a lot of food. So he said, "You take out five kilos of garbage uh, from your favela and give it to us to process." And we will give you one kilo of food. And slowly, the, the, all these slum areas got completely cleaned up because they couldn't even take garbage trucks into the lanes because it's so tiny. So he got people to actually 
uh, clean up the village through these social incentives uh, in it. All the riverfront areas, he said, you know, rather than build right up to the riverfront, since the river flood only occasionally, uh, he created greens along the riverfront. And these greens also became uh, food productive areas. So people could actually have their food sources, public food sources, just off the river because water's flowing over there. So you, people, the poor people could actually even have food gardens growing it as a community space on these riverfront areas. Yeah. Uh, so coming to what's gone wrong with the world, you know, we, we talk about climate change and the heating of the earth and polluting materials. So there's very, one very simple uh, example, and this is done, uh, it's analysis done by this lady called Anne Thorpe. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting book called The Atlas, Designer's Atlas of Sustainability. And it talks about over the last hundred years or so, um, before we used to use all biosphere materials, we used the surface rock, we would use uh, the materials, the bamboo, the wood from the surface. Uh, so everything was renewable, the mud, whatever, for building. But in the last hundred years or so, we used lithosphere materials. So we use materials which come from under the ground, like coal, oil, you know, all the metals that we come out. And the earth has lived in peace, you know, before that hundred years, very well being able to process, you know, all the wood would, would rot and go back into the ground, the mud would slowly slip back into the ground. So nature was able to actually deal with the materials, but the lithosphere materials are something which are extremely polluting. They, they actually, <clears throat> you know, they, they cause uh, toxins, they, they affect uh, animals, they affect the soil, they affect human beings. So the earth hasn't had enough time, it's only 100 years of time to deal with these lith lithosphere materials. So we have, are to actually check the damage we're doing to the earth in terms of global warming, in terms of pollution. We need to try and reduce the amount of lithosphere materials we have. We need to get back to a more biosphere materials. And, and there are tips are showing that. So that's the example of what the earth is like. You, know, you have the lithosphere, which is the core. And of course, we have the biosphere, which consists of water and uh, all the, you know, the plants and animals that, that uh, are around it. And if we are to preserve both the, the biosphere and the hydrosphere and the atmosphere, we need to sort of reduce the amount of lithosphere materials uh, we use here. So we as an office actually are trying that in our own little way. So uh, we are in part of a, a part of Goa, which is um, close to an urban area, but it's in a rural area. And so a few architects and designers got together and we created this community, which is called Design Valley. Uh, so we have three central buildings, uh, which are the, the buildings we work from, which is the architecture building, the product design building, and the central building is the design center where we have run all our programs from. And around that are houses where all the people lived. And uh, this community is, is really, we're looking at how do we actually uh, address the issues of humanity through the design process. We've even set up a trust called COCOM. Uh, we, we recently had a social design festival in Goa, which talked about all the issues of development. And uh, it's where we're looking at design in the public domain, because we, we, we believe design can actually make a big difference to people's lives. So design is, is not about, you know, making buildings or products or something. Design is even designing a social system or even a, a form that people use to, to apply for something in a government uh, uh, office or something. It's all about communication. So communication is part of design. Design is all about uh, community and, and uh, social systems as well. So how do you use design? Take it in a broader sense and uh, take it forward. So our community has tried to do that in a small way. So those are the three buildings that we have and all the various activities that we have within it. Um, we've gone off the grid. So um, the architecture building uh, produces all the power for the buildings there. So we're off the grid, we produce power. The next building actually produces, it has a roof for a garden on it. And we also have a large garden, you can see on the slide to the left, it's a permaculture garden of about 2,000 square meters, where we actually grow our food for the community. So all the food is grown on site and we have a community kitchen. In the space. So those are some of the buildings there. And that's the inside of, of uh, the buildings where our, our architectural offices and our, our, our workspaces are in the design center. 
So the design center is where a lot of activities take place. So we have these workshops where people come, they present uh, to various communities. We have cultural events that take place in it. And it's all about uh, sharing with people. It's all about, you know, uh, how do you actually use design as a medium of communication uh, where you involve the community and where you start addressing all these issues of sustainability in a way that uh, you make people feel, you know, welcome and participate in it. Yeah. Uh, so recently, uh, when the pandemic was on, we didn't have, a, we had to shut the offices, but the, uh, the main building to actually turn into a health center. So there's a lot of migrant labor in Goa. Uh, so a lot of people contributed, came together. We got food stocks together, we packaged, and we started supporting all the migrant labor in Goa. We had about a lack of people, though we supported only about 5,000, 6,000 people uh, with food, medicines, and everything. We realized that when you're an architect, you're not just about designing buildings. It's, it's about being involved in the community. It's about participating. It's about contributing. So it's important that as architects, we are enablers. You know, we, we've resigned our roles at the moment to be this very small thing of, you know, just building designers. But we are more than that. Our educational system gives us so much more in being able to broaden our view on the world and being able to participate in an empathetic way to what's going around us. And I think this pandemic has really shown us a great way in which we can actually rethink the way we practice and rethink the way we can actually uh, have our role as architects in the community. And that's our, our little, you can see one edge of one of the buildings in the thing, and we're at the edge of the forest uh, in Goa. Uh, it's raining heavily now, but this is, a, this is during the summer months. And uh, that's all I'd like to talk about. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Wonderful, sir. It's actually uh, highly engaging, uh, and I know so much of uh, so right from a space building to going to bigger spaces, you know, or resorts and hotels, and then uh, communities and so on and so forth. But uh, we have not exactly. seen any concrete jungle. We see only greenery, vegetation, things like that. Yeah. So uh, to open up, uh, what I feel. Uh, uh, the you people actually it is a uh, it's a built form what we call architecture is a built form this is a built space it looks like built open space that is kind of uh, your architecture uh, uh, philosophy and uh, um, uh, moreover uh, the, we, we find there are walls but then uh, uh, there are more openings in walls are more openings you just uh, there are a roof you 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 your philosophy is to have a roof and then the walls are not uh, anything uh, on a supporting side. It's all for having openings. So it's a wonderful uh, piece. Even looking at that on the screen itself, now feels like you know, we have to go there and uh, uh, feel yeah. experience. So it was a very uh, mind throwing uh, wonderful uh, presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have uh, our, our two panelists. I want to introduce our past uh, uh, chairman of uh, Indians of uh, Samnadu chapter. And uh, current uh, uh, council member, our uh, uh, professor uh, Manoran, architect Manoran sir, and uh, architect uh, Siddiq from uh, Tirchi. He is the chairman of uh, Tirchi Center. So they are also the panel. So now I think uh, our panelists also have got some uh, uh, questions to ask you. Uh, uh, architect Manoran sir, why don't you uh, start off with our interactive session? Uh, thank you, Logo. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, session. Thanks, thanks to IA Tamil Nadu chapter for organizing this. Uh, uh, Dean, it was a real uh, good uh, experience to go through. No, like you were telling about uh, uh, building, then it it's actually what uh, you have been creating is unbuilt environment and stuff. <laughs> we, we are talking about built environment, but <laughs> you have been going on creating unbuilt environment all over. Uh, okay, my question is like you were, uh, see, you, uh, you said uh, your uh, JJ education was uh, technology oriented, uh, but uh, uh, you uh, have, uh, what you have been practicing is uh, not uh, technology oriented, at least the architecture part of the thing, your thing is not uh, technology oriented and things like that. So what you have learned in college and what you have been practicing, if you are talking about that, like, 
how do you think the education should uh, should be uh, from now on how do you think well that's a very interesting question and especially now that you know uh, our techs have lost a lot of their uh, well, rights i would say i mean with the recent supreme court ruling that you know uh, anybody can sign a, a plan for submission and uh, so a lot of people are looking at that as, as something very sad that's happened but i'm actually looking at it as an opportunity you know for us because now it puts us a new challenge uh, uh, which we can definitely tackle so we need we need to be far more holistic in the way we approach architecture our courses so far i felt were very you know uh, oriented uh, to joining some office somewhere and working in somebody's office as you know a dust person or plug into something over there it wasn't about allowing you Uh, to become a visionary or think on your own or the influencer on your own you know we need to allow students of architecture to actually you know explore a lot more so i think if we can create courses now that are far more holistic where you start learning about the others there's a very interesting course run at harvard which is called design for living and it's it teaches you about the world outside first no? so that's the first thing we in our first day we jump straight into designing a watchman's cabin or some sort of you know primary school thing you know so it's it's completely wrong you know so we shouldn't be allowed to touch the pen till the end of the second year maybe you know so we need to really understand the world around us first before we can start designing so it's i i would look at uh, how can we actually do that and the, the skill of architects is we no doubt our education is holistic but somehow it's, it's not deep enough and we see at the end of practice like uh, in my own class there were we had four four friends uh, we got together and uh, we go around seeing architecture and building and i'm the only architect practicing so one has become a swamini uh, she joined the chinmay mission um, another joined nasa on the space program and now he's he's gone to, he's in houston on a medical program and a third became an artist and is in japan and uh, i'm the only practicing architect so we see a lot of architects all if you look at ratan tata you can look at anand mahendra all of them have architectural backgrounds here but they're doing brilliantly well in their own careers elsewhere so So architecture gives us a great base but it doesn't give us the freedom to move out people move out because you know their families force them or businesses force them to actually get back into something else but if we can design the course if people people can move seamlessly into uh, other areas with this broad education that they have so can we design a course which which after say 3 years like a liberal arts program you can actually you know sort of uh, move into other areas with with the great knowledge that architecture gives you or or the components that architectural education gives you and be effective in other areas of so i think that's that's one thing that we need to look at in education where where young architects are given the freedom because you see so many young architects who now they they become journalists they want to just write about it. they don't want to practice they want to become researchers in certain areas and you see a lot of corporate offices are taking architects because of the great research ability that they have in the fine years they will actually get in there put material together you know collate it in a certain way they they've got the ability to see order what we taught in architecture understand it and then put it together for some, to communicate to somebody else so it's it's all these communication skills and these uh, perception skills which are you needed in the business world so the architecture can morph into that and you can see so i would think that if our course can actually be broader base uh, to uh, to lead to something beyond architecture so maybe we don't even have to call it architecture maybe it's it's a sort of course which is uh, understanding so you have for example the your sustainable development goals of uh, the un the, the un has put these sustainable the 17 different goals and it talks about all the thing about life so better but you know social system both energy food everything so if if we can actually start an architectural course with these sustainable development goals so we talk about sustainability as the core of of an architectural course and then we we, we go into these individual zones depending on our Uh, areas of concern there are a lot of people who would want to say work with social systems you know with uh, uh, some people who want to work with environmental systems so so can we actually allow these courses to to morph into those areas so i think there's a lot of potential to now now that this pandemic is there where schools and colleges are really at a loss as to how do we conduct the courses it's a great time to revamp the educational system i feel yeah okay that's a question i have another question also like uh, have uh, are you revisiting your uh, 
like buildings, like I mean, not buildings, the unbuilt areas. What <laughs> as the logo would like to say, the, the unbuilt you have designed. Are you revisiting? Now I am asking this question particularly with reference to uh, the. Is there any uh, performance feedback or some kind of a thing? You no, know, like like you were telling about the Bijapur. Uh, wind towers and things like that. Is is there any kind of uh, I think, uh, uh, or any, any feedback uh, uh, that you uh, see can get or it, it flows in or something like that? Yes, it's important. It's very nice you asked that. Uh, yes. I think uh, Professor Architect Manavaran is wanting to find out the introspection into any uh, built uh, designed space. That yeah, yeah actually. Uh, so, so what I did was actually a couple of years ago. Uh, I decided to actually stay in all the hotels I designed. <laughs> so I wrote to them. So, okay. so, and I went to each one of them. I spent one or two nights in them and I created a full report. You know, what is working, what is not working, what they can change, what they do. And it's a very good learning for me because I realized as an architect, you design something, you think it'll work a certain way, but it's very different on the ground. And especially with the years, things change. So, so I created these very interesting reports of, you know, this is what you can do. And my own faults and realizations also came out. It made me mature as an architect as well, understanding mm -hmm. where I'd gone wrong and understanding where I'd gone right in, in certain areas. So, uh, so it's, it's extremely important that we revisit. Before that, we used to send actually this questionnaire. Three years after we finished the house, we send an architect the questionnaire. You know what would happen? Uh, you know how would they liken the building? What are the problems? And uh, you know, so we got all this feedback, written feedback from people. But of course, staying in a house or staying in in a building or hotel that you've designed. Uh, gives you a direct experience here. And the early house that we designed, which is like you know, 30, 35 years ago, uh, the ones that we built, or the people come back to us and say, you know, we want a new bedroom somewhere. Uh, can we change our electrical system to this? How do you do this? You know, so it's very nice to, to have them actually, so it's part, they become like part of the family that they feel that they need to ask your permission to do any change to the house. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. So, uh, like uh, uh, there are other panelists, I think. Uh, 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 actually, yeah. our uh, hmm. immediate past chairman and uh, honorary uh, secretary of uh, AA, uh, architect uh, C.R. Raj sir is here. Yeah. Sir, welcome, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, and, Dean. Uh, How are you? Hi, fine. Good. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. So, good evening, I think, uh, we, we will pass it on to you for your queries to okay. architect Dean. Okay. Yeah, and Dean, it was a very good presentation, and I think uh, I loved the whole, uh, uh, you know, the story of the presentation. Thanks. I think what you have tried to do is, you know, how communities, street life, public spaces, and as Manoharan said, the unbuilt spaces. Uh, I think it's a very good journey. Uh, I think we all uh, appreciate. Now I have one uh, uh, question. See, today we have uh, the policymakers and the community to create uh, social, you know, inclusive architecture involving all sections of the society. What do you think is the way forward for the government and uh, the communities to come together and evolve policies where, you know, all sections of the society, today we have seen because of the pandemic, there are many uh, sections of people who are not having proper built environment or places to stay, including the migrants. How do you think? What is the way? How do you think the way forward uh, for uh, for all of us to uh, think and uh, introspect and come out with uh, you know uh, strategies which can help in inclusive uh, architecture? Yeah, this is a nice question because uh, so right now in Goa we have what are called development committees. So every village is supposed to have a development committee. And uh, so people actually are from each ward in the village, they come, they're part of that thing and they meet once in two months and they discuss what's going to happen in the village. So what, so whether it's issues of, you know, a road thing or street lighting or, you know, new construction coming up in the area or new infrastructure they need. So it's a very participative process of, so they, so it's taken from the lowest level up to the highest level, right from the ward. So you know, your ward member, your ward member, you tell your ward member, you know, this thing, I need a drainage over here, or, you know, there's something illegal coming up over here. So all that is taken to the panchayat level. And the panchayat level goes to the, the, the to the uh, taruka level. And you know, then it goes to the state level. So so it's interesting that, that it comes from the bottom up, you know, for any development decision. And I think that the whole, 
I mean, our experience in participative planning is also that you must create capacity. So when we did the regional plan, <clears throat> I only showed the good example of what you know happened over there in, in that one village. But there are a lot of bad examples also where people didn't understand what development is. No, so the moment they they do something, they would, they would uh, say that you know let's we need some more uh, industries over here. We don't. So they make have decisions which were maybe because they needed more employment or needed something else, but they didn't have a broader view of things. So, so it's important that there's a check both ways, you know, so that you map your resources, you map your resources both in terms of natural resources and skill-based resources. So what's available? Are there teachers here? Are there workers over here? Are there farmers? You know, other people with other skills. So can you map your resources? Like when Goa, when you mapped our resource, we said, you know, it's a very high doctor population ratio. It's a very high teacher population ratio. So therefore, Goa is an ideal hub for, you know, to become, say, a, a medical hub. It's an ideal place to become an educational hub. You know, if you look at a small place like uh, Manipal, uh, outside Mangalore, one tiny hillock, and look at the tremendous amount they've done, it became a medical hub, an educational hub. So because they've got all the doctors and teachers, everything in one place, yeah. So here's, here's naturally there's there's a good uh, uh, skill base over there. So therefore, you can actually tap these skill bases to to do something interesting. And I think it's it's a partnership. The problem is that we, there's always a conflict with the government. I'm also I'm sitting on NGOs most of the time, and occasionally I have a chance to actually speak on on uh, the government side of things. That's when I say in the regional plan thing or on some committee, and uh, <clears throat> there's always a difference and a clash. Here. So it's important we recognize how politics works also, because eventually at the end of the day, the politician wants to feel good and say, I've done this, whatever. So if you give him the chance, you do something, what is good for the community and you say, you did it, you know, then at least you get it done. And he said, he claims that he's, he's thought of the idea and done it. So I think one has to play this, be astute in this whole political game and let, give them, let them have the credit, but you do something that's good for the community. And I think any politician, if, if he's half sensible, will allow good things to happen, but it needs presented well. So I think it's having this table where people come and all sit together and say, this is what we plan. And you've seen great success. If you look at what uh, uh, has been done in um, uh, Prasad, I mean, not, what's his name? Uh, in Pune, uh, who worked on some of the street areas, Prasanna, Prasanna Desai. You know, again, he sat, he sat with the government and actually worked out uh, new street patterns. And he's taken all over now the state, in fact, you know, working on different cities to to actually improve the thing. So here's one architect who's able to sit with the government across the table. And you see a lot of other cases which where people have been successful in actually dealing with the government and making a big difference. And I think IIS got tremendous potential because there's no one person where you can say that it, you know there's some vested interest or something. Those organizations, you can do that. If you look at uh, even colleges, actually, you can, if UCLA in, in uh, America, uh, their master students actually work with the government on live projects, you know, so whether it's hospitals, schools, and everything. So the government gets inputs, great research inputs, great design inputs from the university directly. So and for public buildings, yeah. so I think there's a tremendous opportunity to for us to actually partner with the government and rather than have this you know, disconnected system where the lowest bidder gets uh, to do what is there. And that's that's the sad thing that's happening because. You're either very well politically connected or you're the lowest bidder, which is usually some ridiculous price, uh, you know, kickbacks involved, you know, corruption comes into the system. So it's it's important that that we get, uh, you know, this partnership so it, everyone feels part of it. And it, it's a collective decision making that takes place. Okay, thank you. And um, the best example of your philosophy is the how you located your office and uh, the beautiful environment which you're working with. I think that is a uh, lesson why we all have to, I think, uh, emulate and see how we can uh, be part of nature. I think I will allow other panelists to come in and uh, share. Yeah, something. yeah. Actually, uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, architect Dean's office itself is a great inspiration, mm -hmm. and uh, he says uh, there's a great big rain going on, and you know it, uh, the whole serene atmosphere inspires everybody. Uh, we have uh, our. Uh, Chairman of uh, Indian of Architects, uh, Tamil Nadu chapter, uh, Architect Sandil Kumar. Uh, Architect Sandil Kumar, you can uh, come up with your question. Sandil ji, please unmute, unmute your mic. An excellent presentation Mr. by Mr. Dean. Looks like as if we have seen a movie in fast forward mode. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of information packed, jam packed information in one hour. Even one second, we couldn't afford to, even I, I wouldn't. <laughs> 
like turn around uh, to so just to take my phone also so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that point of time i had i had a mistake but the point was the so it was totally informative and we were able to connect to whatever he says he said no in the from the lithosphere we should take only uh, the taking uh, like many things it's it is, it is harmful for society immediately i could connect to the myanmar that uh, jade uh, jade mines they had a landslide and and uh, one sixty person died recently two days back in myanmar so you know like uh, like whatever he said we were able to connect to uh, to all uh, his uh, information very well that shows that you know we like you know we also feel the same way but then we don't work in that way uh, maybe we are too much attached to, to concrete and steel uh, i just wanted to ask you like only one question mr dean uh, the thing is in your uh, in your designs uh, i see architecture and and the structural design both are integrated uh, oh, we cannot yeah okay yeah I, in, i lost a little while yeah yeah in your designs uh, both i think you have to repeat uh, architecture uh, yeah yeah in your designs mostly architecture we cannot like differentiate between architecture and structures like they both are uh, integrated so much if we, uh, i don't know because we have the structural engineers here who can only design with concrete and uh, steel uh, and uh, i think even if you go for steel building also uh, there are no expert in designing steel buildings so how do you do you have any consultants uh, do you have like inos consultants or uh, do you appoint uh, external consultants like, most of them are uh, uh, yeah, part of architecture i'm seeing so uh, can you tell us that secret so that we can also try that yeah so, so basically the fact that we have, for the first 10 years of our practice we built all the structures that we have so we generally you know we we uh, understand structural principles and uh, for something small we can do it ourselves but for something larger we've generally taken on board architects i mean engineers who have a far more uh, experimental and uh, uh, who want to actually try out something new and we challenge them a lot you know like in the cathedral when we did the structural system over there this uh, we challenged first he came up with a typical trussing system and i said no, no i want it like trees you know so we designed this little concrete pad so each each of the column is actually a separate uh, uh, structural system so it has a circular pad it sits on it goes up and it branches up and then it connects at the upper level uh, to various things so there's nothing that ties it in in between so each is independent completely uh, in it and i think it's <clears throat> if one actually challenges people and and shows that you know you can try something different um, i think and if they have confidence that you know it will look good eventually i think there's no real a uh, problem on that so we are also constantly trying to push uh, the boundaries and what we do in in a safe way and uh, so it's i think it's uh, it's important that we we experiment a lot and and challenge the people you know working with us uh, um, to do things so. do you make any models for the sort of structures or do you analyze in the computers uh, the safety features and all like how is it being done like uh... Uh, to to understand the safety of the structures yeah so if we haven't done something that's that's phenomenally daring where we we have to you know really be very careful about it it's it's been experimental and everything but mostly we we make a, like a small model initially now we don't make too much of that thing but uh, uh now yeah basically on the computer computer we can can look at it and check whether it's working okay and uh, engineers of course uh, you know give us a feedback you know maybe you can try this and it different and introduce the material that we're, we're using in it and more recently we've actually been looking at how do we look at prefab structures so, so really pushing the boundary on lightweight uh, because in a prefab structure you you need to go as lightweight as possible because the material is expensive so therefore we should actually use the least amount of material so weight reduction and material reduction uh, the amount of fabrication time you use on a material is extremely important so it needs to be modular in nature so that's another challenge so every 7 years or so we call it the 7 year itch this is your cells change in the body every 7 years we try and start a new approach to architecture you know, so uh try a new style so we push it and experiment with something new so the learning is continuous do you uh, do you uh, advise uh, the architects firms to have you know such a consultant uh, to do more experiments yeah if it's a, if it's a larger firm you can have something but it also limits you to that particular person so so we have different engineers depending on each project so somebody who's really good in concrete somebody who's good in steel somebody who's good in any other natural material like wood or something 
So it's nice to also have an array of different engineers who, who are confident in different materials um, to use at different times. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we'll ask uh, architect Siddiq to <coughs> interact with the architect Dean. Please unmute uh, Siddiq. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hi, sir. Okay. Uh, it was a wonderful, heart soothing presentation, as always. Uh, my question is actually, uh, what's your take on the so-called uh, green, sustainable, multi storey buildings, uh, lead rated, griha rated, IGBC, platinum rating, those kind of things, actually. What's your take on that? That's my first question. Uh, second one is actually, it's a bit hypothetical. Uh, if you were awarded a multi storey building with uh, six FSA to achieve, um, and with, uh, of course, uh, 300 crores of fees, uh, <laughs> will you take up the project or not? If yes, what would be your design approach? These are two, two my, uh, my questions. Thank you. Okay. So, so one of us, uh, I mean, all these rating systems as lead, agree on, it's like, it's like a grammar book. You know? So basically it tells you that, you know, these are the, these are the things that you use to do it. But once you, you have an imbibe, Uh, I, Not audible. Uh, uh, lost. Uh, lost. Uh, uh, I guess there's some to issue with regarding to his connectivity. Mm. It was about to begin an uh, interesting yeah. conversation. Yeah, he's back. Now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So it's important that. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's important that you take on um, all the components of a lead rating system or these energy rating systems. That understand them. Uh, but don't necessarily use them to control the building so much. You take them on board and allow freedom of thought because the moment you, you let them govern exactly the way they tell you to, you, your creativity in the building will reduce. Uh, and uh, so I think it's good to have the system, but it's you, once you've learned the grammar, you don't have to be, you know, it's like a bylaw thing. Once this is the, the framework of what you want and within that you play around. You don't let it you know, control your design. Regarding the 300 crores, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I would take whatever is a fair fee and the, I'd use rest for the community. <laughs> so, it's, um, so, it <laughs> so it's important. I mean, look at the experiment. So there's um, uh, a lot of, there's this lady, I forget her name. Uh, I think uh, uh, her name is, um, so she runs this organization, uh, which is uh, really uh, educating builders across India. Um, so she uh, takes builders to places say, in Europe and uh, shows them great examples of development. Uh, so, for example, in New York City, she last year I think she took, took some uh, builders there, Asia and some others over there, and showed them this uh, building method where uh, <clears throat> it was a subsidized building thing. So that there, there were high-end apartments and low-end apartments created in the same complex. Uh, uh, where most builders would never look at the low end or you know, the middle income group or low income group housing societies. So the city actually gave incentives for them to, it's like our S uh, SRS housing where you cater for the poor, but this is an integrated system. Generally, we try and take the poor and put them into these 10 story buildings, 10 feet apart. But here they actually integrated housing in that. And they found it very, very healthy for the community because we have people from different sections of society. So there's a great learning of, you know, the rich from the poor, the poor from the rich. And there's a great sharing that takes place because they'd meet in common spaces, they'd exchange stories. And people became more empathetic to the way other people lived there. You know, so, uh, so it's these experiments that need to be uh, done in our construction industries. Uh, so she's, she's actually, uh, I'm gonna forget the name of the, uh, the organization. So there's this guy called Jean uh, Goel who's, uh, a planner, urban planner, who's actually worked with uh, cities. He's, he's spoken in India a lot of times. Uh, and uh, it's all about, you know, bringing community, communities together, creating good open public space. Uh, all our cities now are slowly losing uh, open public space. Everybody's getting their community and uh, there's very little space left for the public to actually interact. I know in Chennai, you'll have this some 15% or 10% no? open space at the side of the road that is supposed to leave from uh, public area. But 
it's hardly utilized. No, it's usually usurped in some way or left dead over there. But so all these laws need to be thought out properly, so that one can, you know, be effective in that uh, process. Sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Over to other panelists. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. I think, uh, uh, sir. you have some question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Sir, uh, we are in the era of post-pandemic uh, uh, scenario. Uh, in this case, you know, we were we were actually doing uh, smart cities uh, till this post uh, this pandemic uh, it is. Uh, what do you suggest that you know what we have to do basically when uh, with regarding to smart cities integrating smart cities with sustainability and also uh, look at uh, uh, participative approach uh, towards these things yeah unfortunately this the smart city movement i mean we've seen uh, i mean it's been there for many years now but uh, uh, there are not much success stories that are taking place, which is really sad because I think the concentration on smart cities has been more about this technology thing and it hasn't really addressed real problems. So I think the template of smart cities needs to be looked at carefully again. And what are the things? And I keep on saying when you're looking at smart cities, we need to look at the bottom up. You know, when we look at transport, we need to look how are the poor treated in our cities. So we create a resilient bottom where you take care of the poor first, then you know, automatically then even the rich will benefit from it because they are creating, I mean, look at in cities like Bombay or something, the poor live like a lot, sometimes two hours journey away. They spend so much time, you know, just traveling. You know, they, they don't have proper facilities in terms of where to buy stuff from, proper healthcare facilities. And so if smart cities should be looking at, at the poorest section of society first. And then only should they move up into the other things that they talk about of energy, mobility, CCTV, all these sort of monitoring systems. That, so if they can take care of the, of the bottom end of the pyramid first, then we can really see these cities improve. And smart cities now, you can see that how cities are failing, you know? So why are we spending so much on cities when we should actually be looking at rural areas? We, rural areas have performed much better, especially in economically in terms, because you've got food at close source, you've got your other source, water and everything at close source. There's greater community sense at, uh, in these rural areas or semi-rural areas, even up to tier three cities. So really, we should looking at, at smart villages and creating how do we actually make our villages. People do not leave villages uh, to come to cities because it's exciting and they, they, they come there because they want to earn more money. The villages are dying, the villages are collapsing. So we haven't put enough investment in our villages. We put enough investment in our villages. We won't have the pressures that our, our cities are facing and we won't have the need to create even smart cities. So we need to look at, at the lowest level, the problem from where it is happening and eventually we talk about the, India is like becoming urban, more urban, 50% uh, now urban, but our, we cannot deal with that. I mean, our systems are soon collapse. I mean, our power requirements, water requirements, energy requirements, the vehicles moving on the road are going to be, you know, tremendous problem. A city like Barcelona, for example, uh, now with this pandemic, no one is going, you know, driving on a, a thing that even public transport, no one wants to go by public transport. And they fear that once the pandemic is over, People will start using their cars even more. They won't, don't want to use, and there's going to be even greater congestion on the road. So before the pandemic is over, they're, they're making cycle lanes. They're marking cycle lanes. They say only one lane for cars and one lane for buses, and the rest all cycle lanes there, which is a great idea. So by using the pandemic, if it, if the city continued, then we didn't have a lockdown, they wouldn't have got a chance to. People have objected and say, no, 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 why, why are you taking this thing? So now that they've got this thing, people have started cycling all over the place, and they'll get used to the idea. So not only will you have less pollution, the thing you can see our cities are cleaned up so beautifully, and but they'll also have healthier people. You know? People are cycling and healthier people. So it addresses two major problems that cities are having: you know? so a healthy environment and healthier people. Mm. So, so you suggest that uh, uh, provision of urban amenities in rural areas will be the one of the solution, uh, which is also uh, the vision which uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gandhiji said it, you know, he says the future of India lies in our villages. No? So um, unfortunately, Nehru took it in another direction, but uh, which is good, we maybe built up infrastructure, whatever, but it's now it's time to really look, look back at our villages and, uh, you know, and see how we can re regenerate uh, economic employment in our villages, uh, people to stay there and have a much better quality of life. Actually, uh, uh, to, uh, you were showing one of your island resort and then you mentioned uh, 
uh, that you told the client why develop a hotel instead of develop tourism so that was a very good uh, mm-hmm. learning yeah that uh, one of your island uh, uh, designs and now then we went to the community yeah, and then brought the community to become a part of the total uh, uh, system yeah. so i think that's a great learning from there in fact manohar sir you have any any more questions uh, uh, no i saw uh, some question and in the q and a there were a couple of questions uh, one was about what is the present yes. status of goa original plan the second one was how do you make your tile roof watertight I mean, I just it's not like maybe I think uh, our great team would like to answer both. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the questions are two ends of the spectrum, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but regarding the first one, the regional plan is still uh, uh, on. Uh, so we created a fairly you know, universal plan, which is there. Uh, uh one of the thing is that the regional plan cannot be changed by individual changes so luckily we had an IS officer who made sure that that was happened they're trying now to slip in a clause which says that they can do minor changes because of you know personal problems of somebody whose land has been left out and and things like that. and they've also created an investment promotion board to sort of uh, push projects through there may be a few genuine cases but most are you know it's like developers projects or industrial projects which are damaging to the environment so we're saying that you know you wait for the next regional plan to come out and it's a regional plan has can have a 10 year 20 year sort of uh, span for its validity so but you can put the thing up there is enough land to develop you don't want to develop in an eco sensitive zone so uh, so these are people need to realize that you shouldn't be allowed to build anywhere we have to be very careful of the environment and we have to ensure that you know it's for the greater good i mean the regional plan is is a public uh, process you know it's not about an individual applying and and i want to change this and i want to change that it's about what is good for the general public the plan should represent that uh, in its thing so it's in terms of changing the plan it has to be a very careful process and therefore again a participatory process in in changing or adding on uh, to the plan regarding the tile roof uh, um i would <laughs> I would think it's. I mean, um, more recently, actually, we've, the tiles are um, are the great material. They're made out of clay, uh, but they're also heat up. So you know, tiles have tiles have joints in them. Uh, they they no doubt produced by local people. Uh, but we've been using actually. We've been trying experiment. Can we use an industrial material in a sensitive way? So can we actually? So we've been using actually these thermally insulated metal sheets, even on the jungle lodges. and they perform brilliantly they are very industrial uh, but uh, i think that the lightweight nature of the of the sheet makes us have almost a minimal structure there's hardly any roof structure that we have because the sheets almost span these enormous amounts here. and uh, uh, so while we feel guilty about using industrial material the energy saving that we have in using such a material is actually tremendous so it's very important like especially when you're going in for like lead rating system is to weigh the pros and cons of things so how you know we shouldn't shun ourselves completely even saying no and all industrial materials are bad yes they may be bad to a certain extent but can you minimize use or can you use it in a strategic position which is effective you know so and tiles are great yes in certain uh, situations and it's uh, one of the simplest ways to make sure a tile roof doesn't leak is to make sure that you have the right slope in it that you use a good quality tile um that you insulate it properly you keep it and even if it does leak you know it's 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 nice you know it's raining outside <laughs> now you said the uh, i mean the nice. questions are from the extreme south the spectrum you represent the extremes of the spectrum and you presented the extremes of the spectrum as well <laughs> that's why the questions were also also <laughs> like that yeah 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 so so that's so nice uh, sir i have one small uh, question where i i look Uh, at your background there is something hanging on now is it kind of a panga kind of a thing or what is that oh, yes, and yeah, i see yeah. another panel yeah that's a panga so that we uh, design so uh, how do we operate it uh i'll just show you how do you me. operate and then i see a fan also so i find yeah, 
Greg Dean is so excited to show us, you know, functioning. That is wonderful of him. Yeah. So that's our Panka. <laughs> okay. So is, there a, wow. is there a motor or something? There's a motor. There's a motor. There's no, there's yes. no man standing behind it. Yeah. Oh, great. That's great, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no no actually this remains of uh, you know the royal uh, only in king's palaces you no know, this used to be there that's what we say <laughs> so, i, I hope so you don't we make someone <laughs> sit outside the door and then the uh, <laughs> employable like the wise used to do <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, uh, it actually it also suggest uh, suggest that you know your office is not a fully uh, kind of an air condition so you are the most of your no, design no air conditioning at all yeah ex- exactly so, so most of your design seems to be having a very low totally cut hvac component is that so sir yeah we yeah we generally discourage air conditioning even in the house where people want air conditioning we say you know for most of the year such a pleasant climate you just dress appropriately right i am in short pants so that i won't show you but uh, i you know, just dress appropriately and uh, you know you keep the building as open as you can and uh, and you can enjoy the climate so why isolate yourself and especially now with the health issues that air conditioning creates i think it's important that our buildings ventilate in fact the new norms say that there should be 100% ventilation which is going to be a nightmare for a services engineer how do you cool such a large volume of air uh, in an air conditioned space so the cost of air conditioning is going to go up already air conditioning costs in cities is about 40% of the energy usage of a building yes. so so it's going to be quite a challenge so our buildings need to be uh, air conditioned i mean less air conditioning put in it and a, a system where it's naturally ventilated you can use plants for cooling you can use water for cooling you can use other methodologies so i think we will hopefully we we'll get more innovative in the way we design our cooling system there. So that was wonderful. Actually, uh, we were looking at the uh, no the excited way you went and uh, switched on this and to show to us. You, that was a great uh, spot, <laughs> and uh, it was really wonderful, uh, sir. I should say that uh, this presentation went on uh, really, really wonderful, and it, there's very good insight, and uh, it should have uh, uh, helped many young architects you know to look at the the way how the the design process should be. and even i i think it has changed a lot of our mindsets and uh, our ways to know here after how to go about designing buildings it's no no we we we, we no more we you have to believe that there has to be walls there has to be openings that is the main kind of uh, very important simple take away from from your uh, presentation sir mm-hmm. so it's been a great time so uh, if uh, we have, have uh, any any more questions otherwise we will wrap up the thing we have got uh, Uh, almost uh, one hour, one and a half hours, one one hour and forty five minutes we have crossed, and uh, that was an awesome presentation. Ah, uh, like Greg Dean thing was. Yes, so I think. Look, uh, no more thing. Uh, I no, know. No, no, no. Yeah. We should really thank our Greg Durgaanand for. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I am. I am having a <laughs> very, very uh, listed down uh, word of thanks. So I think I'll do the honors of the word of thanks as uh, as a final thing, sir. Uh, from the bottom of our heart. Uh, Uh, on behalf of uh, EA Tamil Nadu chapter, uh, we thank you so much for uh, taking us to your place for the past one and a half hours or so, and uh, giving a very good insight about you now how uh, sustainable uh, design can actually happen, how actually architects' the perspective of looking towards the community can actually be oriented. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank uh, architect Manohar sir for being with us, architect C R Raj sir for uh, being with us. and uh, architect murali for initiating this uh, series of uh, lectures and uh, seminars and uh, particularly architect durganand for uh, connecting with the uh, eminent personalities like you sir then uh, uh, we thank architect uh, sandeep kumar our chairman uh, ia tamil nadu chapter and uh, our panelist uh, architect sudeep and architect yuvraj who being our technical coordinator and uh, doing uh, things like a uh, magic and uh, we also thank architect uh, antony morais who has designed the invite very attractive invite we thank all the participants for being here thank you one and all thank you and we are coming okay. up with the other uh, further programs kindly be with us i'll take Over you to your right to the office <laughs> wow so <laughs> wow <laughs> that is so nice okay, please <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
thank you participants sir uh, i think uh, we should uh, arrange for for a tour to goa to see all <laughs> your pro- yes. office and your project <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> maybe not only goa maybe uh, uh, other places uh, as well basically yeah we will check with our members if uh, we can actually arrange for a tour we will spend some time one or two days with you sir if you find time with us <laughs> A conducted tour on the spectrum. Thank you all of you guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, participants, for being with us. Uh, we from IA Tamil Nadu chapter uh, shall be coming up with a few more webinars. Uh, stay connected. Stay safe. Stay at home. Uh, thank you for coming over and uh, participating in this uh, webinar series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you one bye and all. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir.